today I will be talking about the influence of management on broiled chickens' quarkers quality. The agenda from this webinar have three points. First, I will discuss the importance of efficiency in animal protein production and the role of chicken meat in food production. Next, I will explore the impact of quality losses in chicken meat, the influence of chick quality, and the influence of management and the environment on the quality of chicken meat. And finally, I will talk about respiratory and locomotor problems in broiler chicken and the relationship of gut integrity on these disease. Here, we see that the global consumption of animal protein has been growing with data from 1961 to 2050, showing that poultry accounts for more than 32% of this animal protein supply. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, poultry meat production expected to increase from just over 121 million metric tons, average from 2016 to 18, to more than 141 million metric tons by 2028. Poultry will continue to lead meat production over the next 10 years. Thanks to its short production cycle, quick market response, and environmental sustainability benefits compared to other animals, such as beef, veal, pork, and chip. Given the ongoing global population growth, expected to surpass 9 billion by 2046, everyone involved in food production, including food production companies, suppliers, and researchers like us, must work towards more efficient production. Food availability, access, and adequate nutrition are three pillars of food security. With the rising population, the demand for food production highlights the importance of efficiency and sustainability aligning with sustainable development principles. We need to produce more food. So, I ask you, what's the meaning of efficiency? Efficiency refers to the virtue or characteristics of being competent and productive, achieving optimum performance with minimum errors and expenses. In broiler production, this means low costs while ensuring quality and production efficiency. Nowadays, it's not just a trend but a necessity for the entire agribusiness food chain to be sustainable. The continual improvements in feed conversion ratio translate to 1% annual reduction in their carbon footprint to the global poultry sector over 50 years. Today's broiler produce a 50% smaller carbon footprint than those in 1970, and birds in 2030 are projected to have about 15% less carbon footprint than today's birds marking steady progress for the poultry sector. Modern poultry farming demonstrates more production efficiency, showing greater responsibility toward the circular economy by better, utilizing natural resources, optimizing process, and using durable, recyclable, and renewable inputs to produce more meat. The first part conclusion. Increasing meat production to feed the world population is one of the main challenges for broiler producers. To achieve this, it's crucial to extract the maximum nutrients from food, converting them into growth and production of packaged meat for sale, more human edible food. When slaughtering a broiler chicken, what's the specter carcass weight? The answer is, it depends. Meat quality is affected by complex parameters throughout the production cycle. Critical practice for producing high quality carcasses include nutrition, rearing conditions, environmental and pre-slaughter management. What happened to these carcasses? What management factors may be related to these quality losses. 
These photos are examples of inefficiencies in different stages of the production or slaughter process. What field, what management, or what animal health factors are associated with loss of carcass quality? A carcass like the one of the left that presents aerosacolytes with an established inflammatory process, or this another one carcass on the right with skin scratches. What is the orange of these defects? What factors increase the occurrence of these injuries? The answer will always be multifactorial. And we can minimize the consequence or eliminate the causes through appropriate management and environment control. The integrated poultry system has information that makes it possible to track the factors that may be causing losses in carcass quality at the slaughterhouse. Therefore, it's necessary to return to the information on the steps prior to slaughter. This picture shows that the field and the industry functions interdependently and are highly interrelated. Management factors in the field, animal health, nutrition, and an efficient process in the industry influence the quality of carcass, their losses, and condemnations. Consider that the tick is the primary raw material for producing packaged carcass it becomes clear that the quality of the chick is crucial for its development until the day of slaughter. There is a critical relationship between the quality of the day-old chick and its post-hatch performance as a broiler. This quality is influenced by the management of the breeder hand and the incubation conditions during the embryonic development stage. After hatching, these factors significantly reflect the chick's subsequent performance during the rearing period. The process begins with the breeder hen. The quality of the chick is directly linked to how the breeder hen is managed. This is because the chick's embryonic development and its subsequent growth in the field both depend on the breeder's health. Important factors include the transfer of maternal antibodies and the chick's ability to grow in the face of the challenges of a new environment. This quality is the result of combined efforts by the breeder farms and the ratchery to provide customers with chicks that can reach their maximum zootechnical potential. The developing embryo and the newly hatched chick rely on the nutrients stored in the egg for their growth and development. As a result, the physiological state of the chicks and hatching is significantly influenced by the nutrition of the breeder hen, affecting the chick's size, vigor, and immune status. Additionally, Housing chicks from breeders of various ages can lead to non-uniformity in the batch from the first day of life. The first seven days provide an opportunity to maximize gut development, which is the most important factor for optimal broiler performance and survivability since the gut is critical for the immune function of broilers. Considering that a broiler chick's gut grows up to six times its initial weight in just seven days, it's impressive. In less than five weeks, this gut system needs to randle the outside appetite of the bird, which may consume around 10% of this body weight per day. The graphic shows the importance of achieving a good seven-day weight, further emphasized by the fact that for every 10 grams, improvement in seven-day body weight, an improvement of 40 to 60 grams will be achieved at 35 days.
under good management conditions. The strong relationship between body weights at seven days and market age indicates the importance of cheek quality and its carryover effects. The quality of cheek directly influences the quality of the meat. The hatchery plays a vital role in determining the physical appearance and overall quality of the chick. If the hatchery receives eggs that do not meet quality standards, producing a high quality chick is unlikely. Approximately 80% of the hatcheries results depend on the quality of the hatcherable eggs. Therefore, variations in chick weights can lead to inconsistencies in meat cuts in the processing stage. Uneven eggs produce uneven chicks, and it affects the quality of the chicks as the requirements of the eggs during incubation are also determined by their size. Therefore, the temperature and humidity protocols in the incubator, along with the incubation time, must take into account the weight of the egg and its genetic lineage. And in situations of poor development, uneven chick size or even mortality may occur. In these field situations, we observe non-uniformity among the birds, which could stem from variability in chick quality. These situations lead to changes in eating habits, poor feed conversion, increase in scraping, and non-uniformity of carcasses in the slaughterhouse. Consequently, there is greater contamination in the visceration machines and inefficiencies in the boning machines. Additionally, there will be a higher number of carcass classified as thin or wasted. Here, we have more photos showing field situations where the birds are uneven. And in the photo on the right, you see uneven birds arriving at the slaughterhouse for processing. On these slides, we see the consequences faced at the slaughterhouse. In the left, internal contamination within the carcass, in the middle, rupture of the intestinal loop due to inefficiency of the abdominal opening machine, and then cuts in the final portion of the intestinal tract caused by the inefficiency of the cloaca extractor machine. These contaminations involving gastrointestinal content compromising the hygienic and sanitary quality of the slaughter process, which may compromise food safety. In the slaughterhouse, we also encounter wasted carcasses or cachetic carcasses. The cachetic carcasses are easily identifiable by the pronounced kill, as shown in the image on the left. All these changes lead to product loss and reduced food production. As mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, this results in lower production efficiency and less protein being produced. That means less human edible food. Therefore, it's crucial to evaluate quality performance indicators for one-day-old chicks to improve batch uniformity and, consequently, mitigate losses in meat quality. To ensure proper feed intake and appropriate body weight gain, it's essential to monitor the following key performance indicators. The first one is percentage of ticks with full crop. At two hours after placement, aim for 75% of ticks with a full crop. 12 hours after placement, the target should be over 85%. And at 24 hours after placement, strive for more than 98%. If these targets are not met, 
It indicates a need to review key management requirements and take corrective action. A common issue during this period is failing to adjust the brooding temperature soon after placement. In case of overheating, chicks may drink instead of eat. It's also important to assess hydration by observing the shine of the legs and vein of the bird's leg. Additionally, it's crucial to evaluate the presence of hawk injuries or deformities. In this image, we can see red and swollen joints, which might result from maternal nutritional deficiencies or inadequate incubation conditions that lead to strain during hatching. This issue is typically linked to poor conditions in the incubator or hatcher. Overheated chicks push against the shell with their legs to hatch as quickly as possible and consequently causing damage uh, to their joints. I will discuss locomotor problems in more details later. Finally, it's essential to evaluate the quality of umbilical healing by looking for signs of incomplete kennel closure. In cases of poor closure, there is a risk of creating a gateway for bacterial or fungal contamination. As a consequence, poor umbilical closure can lead to omphalites, as seen in the central photo of a slaughter carcass, or other infections such as cellulitis. You can also observe aerosaculitis in field necropsies and in the carcass in the slaughterhouse. The images show air sacs with thickened membranes and cesius exudate with yellowish fibrinous material and the visceral pleura of the lung. In 2021, Brazilian poultry farming experienced a notable raise in aerosaculites cases within broiler production. In that year, a study was conducted in hatcheries of four broiler chicken producing companies. The aim of this study was to assess the sanitary and physiological quality of the batches containing dead, unborn embryos, and one day old chicks from companies that reported early instances of aerosacolites. For this research, a total of 347 birds from 29 different flocks of brother chicks were necropsied for both microscopic and microbiological analysis. Of the 29 flocks evaluated, 18 were found samples with aerosacolites, accounting for 62% of the flocks. The microbiological research identified Escherichia coli in 58.3% of the positive flocks and Klebsiella in 12.5%. The impact of neonatal colibacillosis should not be underestimated as it affects the performance of the flock. This impact is not limited to mortality in the first week but extend the productive and health performance of the birds up to the age of slaughter, including losses in carcass quality. Other health challenges related to the occurrence of aerosacolites include the incidence of avian infections, bronchitis virus in breeders' hands. Therefore, it's important to ensure the immune protection of the mother and consequently improve the quality of the progeny. So when the eggshell is thin or deformed, there is an increase in contamination, a greater number of second quality chicks and a consequent worsening in performance. In this case, we may have more mortality in the first week, greater rejection and a greater occurrence of aerosacolites at slaughter. When primary infections occur with agents 
responsible for causing damage to the upper respiratory tract. They contribute to the development of colibaculosis due to the destruction of the integrity of the upper respiratory tract barrier. Viral respiratory pathogens include avian influenza Newcastle disease, infection bronchitis, and avian pneumovirus. Mycoplasma, Staphylococcus, Bordetella, Pastorella, E. coli, and others have been identified as the most serious bacterial respiratory pathogens in poultry. These are common agents that lead to aerosacolitis. Talking about environmental factors related to respiratory problems, we can talk about air quality. Severe indoor air pollution problems in livestock houses emerge with the high density and intensive development leading to respiratory problems. Therefore, levels of ammonia, other gases, and cold air can also cause ciliostasis and trigger respiratory conditions in birds. As predisposing factors for stressing the respiratory tract, we can mention high concentrations of harmful gases, such as ammonia above 25 ppm, other irritating gases, such as carbon dioxide above 3000 ppm, in addition to humidity, dust, climatic variations, high density, deficiency in the disinfection process, inadequate facilities, and contaminated water. All of these factors promote aggression to the respiratory tract mucosa. And when the environment has a high infection pressure for a pathogenic agent, injuries to the air sacs occur. So, it's important to maintain air quality and manage the building's ventilations. Here, you can see the consequences of ventilation's problem. More photos of ventilation problems causing poor little quality. And here, I could spend one more hour just talking about skin quality and pododermatitis. In addition to the fact of tracial tissue, ammonia also causes animals to reduce consumptions. As animals become lethargic and increase condemnation in the slaughterhouse. The results in these graphs show lower weight gain, higher mortality, and higher carcass condemnations when the ammonia concentration was greater than 50 ppm. Currently, efforts are focused on improving immunity and intestinal quality in addition to reducing infection pressure in the housing. The intensity of aerosacolides depends on the simultaneous presence of various factors involved, such as the combination of infectious agents, inadequate environmental factors, and the condition of animal health. In conclusion, it's crucial to reduce environmental challenges that are predisposing factors for diseases and that influence the quality of carcasses and also improve the health status of birds, such as health, food supply, air quality, ventilation, animal density, nutrition, temperature, maternal immunity, and vaccination program. Continuing with the growth phases of broilers, I will now discuss the development of bony tissue and its association with locomotor problems and losses in carcass quality. We have already discussed hawk injuries that can occur due to management during incubation. Now, Let's talk about bone conformation and development involving aspect of nutrition and animal health. In the development of bony tissue in broilers, 
angles are formats that influence the anatomical conformation of the bird's body and depending on external and internal effects, they can influence its development. Bones play a vital role in the normal growth and development of vertebrate individuals. There are two processes of bone formation, endochondral ossification and the intermembranous ossification. Endochondral ossification encompasses the activity responsible for the formation of weight-bearing bones. It's also responsible for the elongation of the majority of the skeletal mass during the growth. The continuous addition of cartilage and its subsequent replacement by bone are central to the process of latening. Intermembranous ossification is responsible for the definitive form of a limited number of bones that are not preformer by cartilage. These figures demonstrate data from a broiler integration in Brazil that slaughter 400,000 broilers per day. The first graph shows the relationship between average slaughter weight and the occurrence of locomotor problems. It reveals that the higher the slaughter weight, the higher the incidence of the leg problems. Moreover, the graph on the right illustrates the relationship between growth rate and the occurrence of the leg problems. The results are similar. It's the evidence that in the first and third weeks, a higher growth rate corresponds to a higher incidence of leg problems. This suggests that the growth rate in these phases significantly influences the occurrence of leg problems. Furthermore, evaluating the relationship between daily weight gain and the occurrence of leg problems, the data indicates that animals with gains exceeding 69 grams are more prone to leg problems, especially arthritis. Additionally, housing conditions have been shown to influence the occurrence of leg problems with a higher incidence in automated systems than in conventional ones. So we need to understand how to manage automated systems and consider the animal density used and daily weight gain to conclude which factors influenced these results. The group of skeletal defects includes arthritis, tenosynovitis, tibia dyschondroplasia, etc. Among these, arthritis and perosis are notable for causing a significant volume of partial carcass condemnation in slaughterhouses. This one. The combination of rapid growth and inactivity is a risk factor for the development of lameness and pathologies related to the locomotor system, the tibia being the faster growing bone in young broilers, is particularly affected. Around 6.5% of tibia fractures are related to tibia dyschondroplasia and abnormality in tibia growth plate development. The figure shows examples of dead chondrocytes can be cleared by the blood vessels in the growth plate zone in normal bone. And the figure below shows a greater number of dead chondrocytes cannot be cleared by blood vessels in the growth plate area in tibia dyschondroplasia. Many factors influence the occurrence of lameness. Among them, genetic, envir environmental, immunological infections, and nutritional factors. An example of nutritional factor is a moderate imbalance of dietary calcium and phosphorus that can be neutralized by increasing levels of vitamins D3. Modern broilers show impaired calcification possibly due to low enzyme activity. Another crucial factor in poultry production, which correlated with bone pathologies, is light intensity and ambient temperature. 
Male birds are more prone to leg health problems, where a proper lighting schedule can be beneficial. Additionally, thermal stress reduces bone mass and its mechanical strength. Furthermore, the prevalence of pathogenic bacteria is associated with temperatures. For instance, E. coli and Enterococcus have higher prevalence in hot months compared to colder months. In field situations where birds exhibit locomotor problems, assessing intestinal integrity is important. If the intestinal mucosa is flaking, as you see in this photo, it can be considered a gateway for opportunistic bacteria, which can cause different degrees of arthritis, as we see in the photo. In such situations of enteric stress, there is a loss of in intestinal integrity and an increase in the permeability of the macromolecules in the intestinal lumen. Bacterial translocation from the intestine to the blood stream may occur. This is the case with opportunistic bacteria such as Enterococcus secorum, which causes arthritis, chondronecrosis, and osteomyelitis. Perturbations in the gut microbiota have been shown to affect bone homeostasis. But the mechanisms by which gut microbiota modulates bone metabolism in broilers with tibial discondoplasia remain unknown. This study, published in 2023 in Biofilms and Microbiomes of Nature, reported that a high glucose level is a predisposing factor for bone disease suggesting that the gut microbiota dysbiosis mediated hyperglycemia may be involved in bone regulation. Gene sequencing and short-chain fatty acid analysis review that the significantly increased level of the metabolite butyric acid derived from the genera baudia and coprococcus regulated glucose level in tibia chondrodysplasia broiler by bonding to GPR109 in the pancreas. Studies on tibias show it reduce expression of vascular regulatory factors based on transcriptomics analysis and reduced vascular distribution, contributing to the non-vascularization of cartilage in the proximal tibial growth plate of tibial discondoplasia broilers with elevated glucose levels. The authors also evaluated the microbiota of these animals with tibial discondoplasia, serving as a tool to analyze possible strategies for modulating the intestinal microbiota. Additionally, the authors did a model with the total flavonoids from rhizoma and validated the improvement and bone homeostasis in TD broiler by regulation glucose levels through the regulation of gut microbioma to subsequently improve intestinal and pancreatic functions. Therefore, research is essential to study intestinal health and management strategies must be tested to control intestinal flora and locomotor disease. Considering that the intestinal microbiota is related to animal health, it's important to control the flora to prevent intestinal dysbiosis. So, intestinal dysbiosis, the state in which low virulence microorganisms become pathogenic, due to a quantitative and qualitative imbalance, negatively affect the animal's health. This leads to an increase in harmful bacteria and a decrease in beneficial bacteria. In scientific research, we can measure indicators of intestinal permeability, such as sugar, such as FITC dextran, pro-inflammatory, fatty acids, 
LPS, or indicator of immunity. Research on the uses of antibiotics alternative in broiler chicken production to maintain gut health, such as probiotics, eubiotics, symbiotics, and prebiotics is ongoing. And we have a lot of research to do in the coming years. One more conclusion is that is the risk factors for etiology of locomotor problem, problems include intestinal health, nutritional programs, and environmental management. To conclude, I will show this slide again because it's necessary to include management and nutritional strategies to reduce environmental challenges that are predisposing factors for disease and that influence the quality of carcass. Finally, I conclude that management has an influence on the carcass quality of broiler chicken.